So many exciting electric car news this week. Of course, we'll start with the top story, which is Tesla Model 3 crashing into an overturned truck while reportedly on autopilot. Eli Burton of My Tesla Adventure is going to be here to discuss that. Dyson reveals its fully operational prototype of their electric car. We'll show you some cool features. Neo announces half a million battery swaps and Tom Malogny of Inside EVs will join me to share his personal experience. Rivian names its next two electric vehicles. And you know, good baby names are so hard to find. I'll share my chat with a Rivian CEO, RJ Scrinch, about moving forward. We will look through all the new pretty colors of the next year's Porsche Taycan. Mercedes posts its very first official picture of the all-electric EQS in camo, which looks pretty much nothing like the concept. And Henrik Fisker will be here to tell us why that always happens. You'll never guess what Germany will require their gas stations to do in the near future, and Tesla gets sued. All of this is coming up next. Welcome to E4Electric, your number one source of electric car scoop. If you're interested in everything that's going on in the world of electric cars, this is the place to be. Just go ahead and click on that subscribe button and the bell notification icon so you don't miss anything moving forward. All right, let's move on to our top story. Uh, it happened again. Tesla Model 3 driving down the freeway in Taiwan has smashed at about 70 miles an hour into an overturned truck. As you can see from this video, it doesn't seem like the brakes were really applied by the autopilot or the driver. There's a little bit of smoke coming out from one side of the car, which means it probably hit the debris from the truck. The Model 3 driver did say that he was using the autopilot during the crash. Himself and the truck driver are okay. We turn to Eli Burton of My Tesla Adventure to talk a little bit more about what we're seeing here and what does it really mean for the beta program of the Tesla Autopilot and a full self-driving technology. Eli, so this is not the first time we see a very similar uh, incident uh, that happened with a large object that's in front of the uh, a Tesla car that has an Autopilot on, uh, but it hasn't happened in a while. Um, where, where, what are your thoughts on this? So yeah, here's the thing with this accident is um, we don't have confirmation yet that autopilot was on. The driver did claim that it was. And to be honest, looking at the accident, it does look like autopilot was on based on the car's behavior. So there's a couple angles of this to look at. One, we definitely need an investigation here because we don't know if the driver's foot was on the accelerator. Because if your foot is on the accelerator while autopilot is activated, it will not take away force control from you and hit the brakes and you're any in, under any incident if you're hitting the accelerator. However, let's look at the side of autopilot and assume that, the, that it was activated, that the foot wasn't on the floor. This type of scenario is one of the things where uh, full self-driving technology and machine-driven vision is still improving and still has some weaknesses. What to us very clearly looks like an overturned truck to this machine vision AI, it can mistake shadows for also physical objects on the road. And by the way, it's something you did a great job parroting in our video about if autopilot was a guy. But as a result of that, it will sometimes ignore things that are non-moving objects because the machine vision may be dismissing it as saying, oh, that's another shadow. So it's engineered so that it doesn't have too many false positives, so the car isn't always slamming on its brakes. But if you have a case of something sitting still, which is usually the other accidents we hear about of like, you know, a, a Tesla on autopilot slams into a back of a parked, you know, fire truck or something like that, a large object sitting still is still can still cause problems for, for the machine vision. Right, but at the same time, it's not just the cameras that are looking at it, it's it's the uh, radars, right? And of course, no LIDAR because Elon believes that's unnecessary, but radars should have caught that. Am I mistaken? Yeah, so that's the probably the biggest surprise to me when I first read that is why like the sonar sensors weren't responding and even at the last second slamming the brakes and they may have, it's not entirely clear. When you look at the act, when you look at the footage, there seems to be some like, you know, what looks like maybe smoke. I actually think it's more of debris 
because how fast these Teslas do slow down just based on the angle of the video, I think if the brakes had been slammed, the vehicle would have decelerated a lot more. Again, I can't say that for 100% certainty, but to me, it did much more to appear to be debris coming up off the road than it did slamming the brakes. But yeah, so now that calls into question is, did the sonar see it and dismiss it? And or was the driver's foot on the pedal? Because if the driver's foot was on the pedal, the sonar wouldn't have had an impact in stopping the vehicle. I know it's a little bit early to make the final conclusions, but I do hope they conduct the investigation. And if they do, I will definitely stay on top of that and let you know what happens. All right, let's move on now. Dyson, as you remember, has released a few pictures of their electric car that they've decided to, you know, but now there are a few videos and it looks like they did have a fully functioning prototype of that car and it was already functioning better than any of their hand dryers you know because when you drove that car you did not end up with a bunch of water on your crotch but it did reveal how much work and money went into that car and some really cool features like the door handles that are very unique also the charge point that's kind of cool and reminds me of a Porsche Taycan's charge point and this is Tom demonstrating that and a cool steering wheel with a bunch of controls not sure if it's too much but definitely something different now interior you know at first when I saw the original picture I was like eh, I don't know about that but now that I see some videos of that I gotta say it's very Ikea and I actually mean it in a good way I guess I really wish they would have actually gone through with this and brought this to production because unlike their hand dryers I would have loved to stick my hands into this product all right, let's move on to NIO. Now, they had a great month of May with a record sales, almost 3,500 of electric vehicles sold. And they also announced that they've conducted half a million of battery swaps. I am a huge fan of battery swaps. That's the only way to refill your electric car battery in as fast of a time as you would refuel your gas car. Now, let's bring in Tom Malogny of Inside EVs, who is one of the very few Americans who experienced this when he went to China. All right, Tom, I know you are one of the very few people, at least very few Americans, who experienced the battery swap by NIO. Um, tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, so back in December, um, I actually did two of those 500,000 battery swaps that NIO says they've completed now. Um, NIO brought me over there to drive their ES6 for a while. I was in Beijing. I got my... Chinese driver's license and um, drove the ES6 around Beijing for a couple days and did two battery swaps. Uh, worked perfectly, took me less than six minutes both times. I mean, uh, maybe seven minutes if you want to count when I pulled up, got out, gave them the car because their employees pull it into the battery swap. You can't do that. And then they pull it out for you. But it was super painless, really easy. Uh, you know, a couple minutes later, you pull out with a full battery pack. All right. And we're watching the video that you actually taped yourself when, when it was being done. And thank you for that, by the way. Uh, all right. So now I know you're also a pretty heavy user of the uh, Tesla Supercharger Network and the Electrify America, uh, among many other uh, charging networks. How does it compare? How does the experience compare, you know, charging um, uh, at the, let's say, Tesla Superchargers and uh, doing the battery swap? Well, you know, uh, the supercharger network's fantastic. I love it with my Model 3. You know, a 15-minute stop is, is really all you need to go to get you to the next destination. The difference with the battery swap is you leave in, in, in you know, half the time with 100% full battery. It's not like you just get, you know, enough energy to go to the next de destination. So, you know, it's, it's a totally different concept. It works in China. I don't know if it would work in the U.S. as well. The thing about China is most people don't live in private homes. They don't have control over their own energy. They live in these giant apartment complexes, most of which don't have charging at the complex. So the Chinese people need a really super robust public charging infrastructure. And what's better than saying, look, um, you know, buy our cars and free unlimited battery swap Anytime you need to, to, to refill, you don't even have to bother waiting. Um, we just pull up and we'll swap the battery for you. They'll even come pick up your car and drive it to a battery swap, swap it and drop it back off in your parking lot if, while you're working, if that's what you prefer. So it's a super like concierge service. Neo's positioning themselves in China as being like a real 
premium brand with premium experience. So works there. I don't know how it would work in the US and Europe as well. Um, it has different challenges, but I can tell you, it's why people buy car Neos in China because of battery swap is the reason why they're buying, buying those cars. Let me remind you that for now, Neo is only sold in China, but they are making their way to Europe, specifically Norway, and they are listed as a publicly traded company here in the United States. All right, before we move on to Rivian's new baby names, let me remind you that this video and this channel is sponsored by Evanex, the Tesla community's accessory store. Use E4 Electric, the name of this channel, as a discount code for all of your purchases over $100. All right, as you probably know, Rivian is going to production in the beginning of next year with R1T, which stands for Rivian's first truck, and R1S, which stands for Rivian's first SUV. But now it looks like they've trademarked a couple of new names. All right, so the new names are R1V and R1X. Now, most people are speculating. <coughs> I'm allergic to baby names, apparently. So most people are speculating that V stands for the van, which makes sense because Amazon has ordered 100,000 delivery vans after investing a lot of money last year into Rivian. But what does the X stand for in R1X? Let me know in the comment section if you have a guess, but most people are guessing it's probably for the crossover. I have recently caught up with a Rivian CEO, RJ Scarinched, and we talked a little bit about moving on from the original two vehicles to creating the delivery van for Amazon. So we launched our truck and our SUV first. So the, the truck SUV end of this year, and then the Amazon vehicle is September of 2021. Uh, so it actually sequences in really nicely. And because the skateboards are shared, uh, so the battery, drivetrain, uh, cooling systems are really common, almost identically the same between the two. It allows us to go really fast on the Amazon program. I cannot wait to see these trucks finally on our roads here in California. But for now, let's move on to Mercedes. Mercedes has unveiled their very first official picture of the production version of their all-electric EQS. Now, as you can see, it's in camo, but you can also see that it looks very different from its original prototype. A few months ago, I was able to check out both of them in person at the EQS concept, which I drove for a little bit. That was a lot of fun, very futuristic car and the Camot production prototype, which, you know, even at that time, it was pretty clear it wasn't going to look anything like the beautiful concept. With the exception of very few manufacturers like Tesla and Byton and a few others, most of the time, that always happens to us, right? We fall in love with a beautiful concept car, but when it goes to production, you go like, hey, who this? So I thought this is about time when somebody tells us what happens behind the closed doors and no one better to do so than one of the most recognized car designers and one of the contributors to this channel, Henrik Fisker. I think when you think about that, it, it, you can look back into cars and in big or in any car companies, you know, you have so many different groups that have a say. So when you show a concept car, a lot of times what happened in the larger companies is they kind of just hand it over to mainly the design department and the design, design department gets really excited and they maybe lower the roof so far down that you can barely sit in the car and the trunk ends up being so small that you can't really fit anything. And when you show a really cool concept car notice that nobody really measures the trunk and a lot of time a lot of people actually don't get to sit in the concept car and at least not in the back seat so therefore all those things get kind of disregarded when you see the vehicle and you go wow i want that vehicle and then of course when it goes through all the production and everything else suddenly the roof gets raised up and the wheels get smaller so they can fit the right turning radius and the base model can be cheap enough because the tires can't be too big and all these type of things. If you want to see the full interview, I will release it in the next few weeks. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss that. But back to the EQS. I know it's not going to look like the beautiful concept. However, I do think overall it's going to look like a pretty decent Mercedes. It does have some really promising stats. It should have over 300 miles in EPA equivalent range, 350 kilowatt charging at the max rate 
It's going in production next year and it will be built at the carbon neutral plant. Speaking of Germany, they're doing something really interesting for their electric car market. They're trying to create a mass market for electric cars and they're doing it as part of their post-pandemic stimulus package. They have already doubled the incentives for purchasing of electric cars. Now in Germany, it's kind of interesting. Half of those incentives come from the government, but the other half comes from the manufacturers. Now they're going to require, get this, all gas stations at some point to have at least one electric car charger. Now, I really hope that they will require the fast DC charging technology because I don't know how much time you want to spend at a gas station charging your car at the level two while inhaling those fumes, you know, watching the Netflix on, on, on your screen. Though, I come to think about it, maybe some Netflix shows should be consumed while inhaling the gasoline fumes. Not this show. This show, you probably should be just, you know, maybe a little drunk, you know, to fully enjoy it. Porsche Taycan will have a few extra colors to choose from next year. Here are some of my favorites. Uh, this one is Cherry, which, you know, I think is very, very beautiful. Here's Frozen Berry, which I think is just a fancy speak for pink, which is my favorite color. I'm not going to lie. So if I'm ever getting a Taycan, this would probably be uh, what I go with. Uh, here's a Frozen Blue. Um, and I got to tell you, I, and I kid you not, this is a color of toilet bowls in Russia when I used to live there in the 80s. And here, this, this is a real picture. So I, I kid you not. And here's Mamba Green. Uh, Mamba is actually a type of a snake. And here you see one that's green, which I'm assuming uh, just basically ate $200,000 of your money, depending on options, and just turned green. So I, I guess I see the appeal. All right, back to Tesla now, and it looks like a bunch of Canadian Tesla owners are filing a class action lawsuit against Tesla. Now, when you piss off a bunch of Canadians over a car, you must have really crossed the line. The lawsuit is over the paint issues because in the colder areas like Canada, there's a lot of salt and other stuff on the road. And when that rides up onto your paint at the bottom of the car, it destroys it. Now, the paint quality issues has always been around for the Model 3 and will probably Model Y owners will join soon. These particular owners are claiming in their lawsuit that it costs almost 5,000 Canadian dollars to take care of the problem to do the paint correction treatment. And they're also claiming $500 in pain and suffering. Man, if I would claim $500 every time I had pain and suffering when I owned my Tesla, I probably could launch my own spaceship to the, uh, to the International Space Station. Oh, Alex, you're such a Tesla hater. All right, come down. Now, Tesla does offer what it looks like a Model 3 all-weather protection kit. It's uh, either $50 or they will give it to you for free if you live in the cold weather area. Now, you can either put the mud flaps on, which, you know, are always very sexy, or the paint protection film. Now, it comes with instructions about 11 steps, where 11 step, and I kid you not, is to go around the car to the other side and perform the same 10 steps over again. Super easy. All right, all jokes aside, I really do hope that Tesla figures this out. I know they've been having paint issues for many years now. You know, people who buy these cars really do want them to look beautiful. You know, especially if they get it in the mamba green color. All right, if you want to support this channel on Patreon, there's a link in the description of this video. Of course, looking forward to all of your comments. Other than that, see you guys next time. And remember to stay charged.